This episode is brought to you by freedadcourse.com. You are always one conversation away from changing your life. And the power of hello is something that I subscribe to every single day. And I'm always saying hello to new people everywhere I go. Increasing your opportunity, increasing your connection, and getting access to the solutions to the problems that you are facing, whether you're on active duty or just beginning your veteran transition, or you've been transitioning out for 20 years. On the other side of hello are the solutions that you're looking for. Again, head on over to freedadcourse.com. Get your five-episode audio course to create more connection, create more friendships, and get back to living the life that you're trying to design had what you wanted in life, he would, he would literally take a little notebook and he would walk up to him and he'd ask him questions and he'd write them down. But the thing is, is nobody taught him that. He, I mean, somebody made the suggestion, but he decided to kind of go and, and seek out information that way. And so he became hungry for information, but then he wrote it down. So that's, that's, a, that's a skill, right? That, that's a tactic that you can use. The, where it actually becomes learning that you can apply is when you take it and you go start to practice it and you're going to screw it up the first time. So that process, I distill down into what I call just get some wins. Dory 1, this is Fireteam Delta. Dad's coming home. Welcome to the Military Veteran Dad Podcast, where it is our mission to bring every dad home. I am your host, Ben Colloy. I'm a United States Marine veteran, husband, and a father. We will bring authentic conversations to inspire action in your life so we can close the gap between the dad you are today and the dad you want to be tomorrow. This is the Military Veteran Dad Podcast. Welcome back to episode 71 of Military Veteran Dad. The world continues to be changing. The world continues to redefine what normal looks like. And if you are spending the time listening to this podcast, I hope that your heart is beginning to feel hungry for change because what I have been going through these last few months, and if you've been listening to the podcast, you know that I've been taking some of the biggest risks, some of the biggest goals to really try to grow through coronavirus and get to a better place on the other side of this. How can I better prepare myself physically, mentally, and emotionally to make sure that I am ready to create the next opportunity to move my life forward when we define whatever the new normal looks like. Today, we have Stephen Cologne. Stephen is just a great guy. He's a Marine veteran, so we instantly bonded. We had some amazing stories. We didn't get a chance to talk about it on the podcast, but we both were, we both been in Okinawa. He was in Kadena. I was stationed over at Camp Hansen. And we, and he's the host of the Knucklehead Podcast. And as a host of the Knucklehead Podcast, he tells some amazing stories about how you have a lot of knucklehead moments in life. And instead of trying to sugarcoat some stories, he tries to unsugar them and go into what was that knucklehead moment that got you where you want to go. So today we're going to talk about how we see our emotions, how our military service is not our life. It's only one chapter of our book, which is something we talk about a lot on the podcast that our family is our legacy. It is not based on a set of circumstances during this finite time that we serve. We all do the best we can with the information we have, which relates to this idea that however you were raised, however you grew up, like that was the best that they knew how to do. And learning how life happens for you and not to you, that's something we really go into. And how do you face your darkest demons? How do you go into that pit that you don't want to go to? How do you go to face that demon inside your heart or inside your mind, wherever it may be hiding, and face it head on? in a David and Goliath type moment to slay that beast and to move past it. This episode is packed with a lot of deep conversations, and I know it's going to bring a few dads home. So with that, let's get started with Stephen Colon. Welcome to the show, Stephen. Thanks. Thanks, Ben. I appreciate you having me, man. I appreciate you coming on. I know we've been friends for a long time, almost probably since the beginning of my veteran journey three years ago, but we've never really had a chance to connect. We kind of flirted with each other last year at Military Answer Conference, and then we decided that we needed to get together more. And so now it's taken a little bit, but coronavirus provided us a nice window for it. And uh, so I'm excited to have you on and appreciate you coming on the show. Can you go ahead and unpack a little bit about your family, your military, and what you're up to right now? Yeah, that's. Uh, I think that's a good summary of, of how we connected. So we connected uh, several years ago, uh, unless my fuzzy Marine Corps mass and Uncle Dragon uh, self is off base with that timeline, but I think that we cut, we, we connected. I think that's, that's kudos to 
um, the power of social media and the power of, of uh, relationship building. And then also just the, uh, the, the common, the common bond that we shared, uh, you know, both spending some time in the military. So I think that, I think that in today's world, social media can kind of get a little bit of a bad rap. So um, I think that you can, you get out of it, what you put in. And uh, in my experience, it's been very, very helpful with connecting with different people. So I like, uh, I like using, I like using the messages and groups and, you know, the ways that we, the way that we connected as a way to, you know, increase the trust factor that way, whenever we do meet each other in person. Yeah. You already have got that flirting stage and you've already got like, Hey, I know that guy. And you can go up and say hello. Yeah. And it's not a, uh, like, Oh, you got to spend the time getting to know each other. You already kind of know what you've been up to and you can go into the next level. Yeah. I mean, when we're flirting at, at military influencer conference, I think that's a good word for it because in a way it was like, okay, we already knew each other. Mm-hmm. And now if we started from scratch, then, you know, then it's a completely different set of circumstances. I might've been but, scared to say hello even. You're kind of like, <laughs> exactly. You're like, I know that guy. I don't know where I know him from, but oh yeah. But anyway, so I, um, so I'd spent, uh, I spent almost 10 years in the Marine Corps to answer your question. Originally, I, I, um, I spent uh, a little over five, or excuse me, a little over four, just under five uh, on active duty. And then I spent the, uh, the rest of that, the balance of that time in the reserves. I was a logistician. Uh, I planned movements, executed movements, and uh, prepped for movements uh, for supplies and packs. Uh, packs is just a, a military word for same personnel. Um, and we we did that through port operations. We did that through uh, what were called ADDAG, airfield um, uh, arrival and departure uh, control groups. Um, and so I worked at Canadian Air Force Base as a staff in COIC in Okinawa, Japan, as part of the Marine Corps for... Uh, uh, for about seven, eight months after I got out of the Marine Corps, or excuse me, after I got back from Iraq in 2009. And, and then I separated from there. I, I got out of the military off active duty and I was ready to get out. But my, my wife and I, um, we had been married and I'll go back to how we had met to answer your question about family. Um, but I got out of the Marine Corps, um, and I, I was ready. I was ready to just go on to something else. I was ready to, to be my own boss, do my own thing. Um, I, I lacked this, uh, I lacked probably a severe amount of maturity at the time. Whenever I got out, I didn't have enough, uh, mental discipline as even as physically disciplined as you can be in the Marine Corps, Marine Corps, and even some of the mental discipline that you can glean from that experience, but I still lacked it, uh, just because the processes that I had used to build it were based off of my will and my determination, not necessarily off of sound, uh, decision-making, you know, fundamental, uh, business acumen, any of those things. I, I, I wasn't necessarily making uh, the best decision. So looking back at it, um, I probably could have done my family and my future uh, a little bit better by staying in for uh, at least a, a, a four more years, giving back to the military in the way that I, uh, in the way that they gave to me. Um, but we separated from Okinawa, moved to, moved to Dallas, Texas. We were pl- planning to move to Denver, Colorado, uh, which is where we were before I joined the Marine Corps. And, um, you know, our family is from Texas, so it was nice to go back to uh, to Texas. Um, I met my wife probably three months or so after I uh, enlisted in the delayed entry program in 2006. And uh, and when I joined the Marine Corps in May of 2006, we had been dating for just a few months. We actually got married in November of 2006. That was the same month that I got uh, two-year unaccompanied orders to go to Okinawa. Um, so met my wife, dated for two, three months, left for boot camp for three months, went to MOS training school, and we still got married in November of that year. So we were on the fast track dating program uh, to marriage, uh, but we've been happily married now for, um, you know, it'll be, was it 14 years? 14 years this November. So uh, I'm thankful. I married my best friend. Uh, We've gone through all the fights and um, turmoil uh, that I can elaborate on uh, as a you know as a couple can, and we have two beautiful little boys, uh, Mason and Clayton, that are nine, and Clayton is about ready to turn six. He's two little boys, and so um, I come from a, a background where I have brothers. Um, my dad's been married quite a few times. He's been married six times, to be precise. Uh, his current wife has been married four times. So between the two of them, they're they're pushing a dozen in terms of divorces. Uh, so I made a commitment to myself a long time ago that when I got married, that was it. And, uh, and so that commitment, um, has caused me a lot of beat my head up against the wall and I'm sure my wife in the same way, but at the same time, my, 
what's come as a result of that is, is a, uh, a bond and a connection like unlike any other. So hopefully that answers your question about military and family a little bit. That does. And it hits in a lot of different ways. Like you, you talk about the, the story of marriage and what your father example that gave you. There's one that I want to kind of go back and see if there's anything, uh, a different story to tell. When you joined the Marine Corps, what was Steven looking for? That's a good question. That's a good question. Um, so up until that point, you know, my dad, uh, the gentleman I was just talking about before, he's, he's, he's still my dad. He did the best he could with, with what he had, <clears throat> you know, but at some point you gotta, you gotta understand it's your responsibility. It's your life. It's your, um, irregardless of, of what had happened to you in the past. Uh, um, you know, I don't know if you, do you, Ben, do you ever, uh, use the Clifton strengths finders? Um, have you ever gone through that, uh, that exercise before? I don't think the, so. Read the book. I've heard about the book. Well, the, re- the only reason why I'm, yeah, it's a good book. It's it's owned by a company called Gallup now, but uh, the Clifton Strengths Finders does a really good job of categorizing what your strengths are. And the only reason I'm providing that as context here is, as I've the way that my strengths are aligned, I have a I have a tendency to look back at the past, and when I look back at the past, it helps to inform the future. Um, so you know, future oriented decisions are informed by what has happened as a result of the past. So what that means is because I was immature in some of my decision-making and because I hadn't necessarily made the best quality decisions, I got stuck in the past a lot. And so whenever I joined the Marine Corps, I was at a mindset where, you know, um, I was, I I felt like I was a little bit of a victim. Um, I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't think it was fair that my dad left when I was 15 years old and I had been, kind of making applesauce out of apples. At that point, I worked construction, moved in with a buddy of mine, uh, sold mortgages at Wells Fargo. I, I, I'd done what I could to kind of pick myself up by the bootstraps, but I always felt like I was slighted a little bit. And, you know, that was a, just an immature look and perspective at what my circumstances were. And so I needed to prove to myself a little bit that I could handle uh, difficult circumstances, um, hard, you know, decisions, which is, kind of what the Marine Corps sets you up for, because uh, the Marine Corps is kind of perfected taking this undisciplined, um, you know, wet behind the ears um, teenager who was used to having their mom making their bed the day be- or the week before, but is now, you know, responsible for millions and millions of dollars worth of government, uh, either inventory or, um, you know, weapons or that type of thing. So that process I needed to go through to prove to myself that I was capable of it. It's not that I didn't know that I was capable of it before I played college football. I was, was married. I was a, I was a, a male. I was a, a, an adult, you know, on the outside, on the inside, I was a scared little kid. Um, and I was a kind of a punk. And so it came across as, you know, immature and, and, uh, you know, always kind of looking for ways to, to slip through the cracks. And, you know, I just wasn't, I just, in my opinion, I didn't I really like myself very much either. So a lot of those things kind of, and I use it a uh, the bravado and ego to try to um, keep people at distance and keep people at bay. And I could use sarcasm as a way to kind of draw them in. And, you know, they were always kind of like wondering what in the heck was going on. So the Marine Corps was an opportunity for me to kind of iron some of those, you know, those rough edges out. And I had a lot of rough edges to, to work through. And thank God my wife uh, stuck with me through that entire time. but. Um, you know, that was just that was just an example of of what I was looking for when I joined. I think you hit on something, a couple different things there that there's something that Tony Robbins talks about a lot that the emotions that you feel in your life, your brain only has the previous experience of that emotion to interpret its current feeling related to it. And that's a lot of what, that's the trap when you use the past, which is the only interpretation of anything you have for forward, your brain, if you had a similar feeling when your dad left, Every time someone leaves in your life, there's going to be some little thread that connects back to that core memory or that interpretation. And it takes a lot of effort to rewire those emotions or even just be aware of it that like, wow, I just felt something, but it's not really real. It's being related to something that I've already grown past. I've already moved past, but yet my brain keeps pulling you back towards it. And the Marine Corps, it does take those un rough edges and move through but uh, similar to me like i joined as the most legally least likely to join the marine corps i could barely run the mile 
I could barely get that three pull-ups. Like I was dangerously worried about getting that three pull-ups when you get to boot camp and they give you that a first test. Like that was my biggest fear. I was like, I'm not a person that can do pull-ups. I probably never did a pull-up my entire life until I met the Marine Corps recruiter. Well, maybe I did during the physical fitness test, but I don't think I actually did any. I think I always never did. I always did zero. And so me, it was like taking the hardest road I've ever taken in my life and trying to grow through it, but really almost through it. And I think it's probably as similar to you. It didn't like completely transform you. It just left a lot of seeds that later in life you started watering because like for leadership was something, a seed that it would left and I found little threads towards it, but it wasn't until 10 years later that I re found that passion because something I liked in the Marine Corps was taking Marines that others had given up on and try to help pull that Marine out that they can't see themselves. But that wasn't until 10 years later that I recognized that desire or that skill that I had honed in the Marine Corps and I just let go dormant. So, and I think this is a little bit because you still got out and you still had a lot of rough edges, but you had all these core seeds planted that now you've grown and you've moved past, but it's, it's not a one magic pill. That's something that, uh, it, you, it can be, but you really have to be almost ready to say goodbye to what you're letting go. And um, there's a lot of people that talk about military transition after service. And I'm a big person that likes to talk about not necessarily the, that transition, but in order to figure out who you are without the uniform, you really need to go back to who you were when you put the uniform on. It's something that's not talked about enough. And it's the reason why I went there with you, because there is a lot of information in that person who you were before and what you wanted in life that you then can use on the other side to pick up the pieces. Like to assume that the Marine Corps gave you everything in your life for the next 50 years is wrong. You really have to go to the before, look at what you've honed after, and then start moving forward. Well, the common the common denominator, and I think that you did a really good job of, of unpacking, you know, a, a, a credible source of information with Tony Robbins. When they talk about a credible source of information, uh, I'm talking about his perspective you know, on um, on identifying sources of, of power or conviction or identifying um, a, a framework that allows for, for people to actually analyze uh, your emotions and how you process them. Uh, all things that if you don't feel like you need help, you won't see as valid. You won't see as uh, whether or not it's applicable or not. And so I think that the, uh, the um, you know, the result that the outcomes of a perspective like what you're talking about will be fundamentally different depending upon the level of, of uh, responsibility that you take for those decisions. So I think that um, to your point, um, let's let's give an let's give an attaboy to those folks who are deciding to go to the military uh, as a source of potentially helping to, to orient or straighten out their their life, so to speak, or if their life is already straightened out, to take their life to another level. Uh, mm -hmm. Because I think. I think the willingness to do that, if you look at the numbers and, you know, statistics in the past kind of informs the future, the, the number of, of people that actually go and, and do that go to service is very, very low relative to the population at large. And so it's an attaboy. However, it's simply just an opportunity, just like anything else that's out there, just like the people who are listening to this podcast, your job that you're fortunate enough to have to go out and create an income right now, or your business that you've taken the responsibility to go out there and perform a high quality product or service in the marketplace for people to part with their hard earned dollars to give to you as a business to feed your family and your employees' um, families. That is your opportunity, you know, whether it's your job, your business, your organization, whatever it is you, that your perspective is, that's your opportunity. And every single day, you know, really, if you want to get granular with it, you have, you know, up to 32 different opportunities, depending upon how you, you know, bifurcate your, your calendar, but you have opportunities to go and, and squeeze as much production from that particular time. Uh, and, and you, Ben, did a really good job of kind of summarizing how, um, you know, how that framework with the absence of, of context, if you can go to Tony Robbins and listen to the to the talk, you could search for all of that, or you could just listen to what Ben had to say and apply and trust what he has to say, that that's mm -hmm. what Tony says, and uh, and go from there. And I, I really like that you cited him as a, as a resource because that was exactly what I didn't do for years. And I see a lot of people doing, they think of the Marine Corps as their life or the, the military as their life, as opposed to simply just a chapter in the book of their life. 
Yeah, and that's where a lot of, I think, especially for Marines, because it literally is an identity that never leaves you. I mean, we, the, the, the whole thing of being a Marine is once Marine, always a Marine. And if you, I think there's the crutch of what everyone, most Marines or anybody in the service, it can apply to all of them, even if without the Marine Corps, always Marine, that if you go into the Marine Corps searching who you are and you're afraid of what you find, the Marine Corps easily applies one for you. And that identity becomes your that becomes who you are. And there was a, 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 a wife of a Marine that killed himself. And he took his own life essentially because he lost his identity and his was, was stripped from him. He, he was medically discharged from the Marine Corps. So it wasn't even under willful terms. And he created the Marine Corps as this like alter persona of himself, but he never really acknowledged the other version. And that is some of the crutch of when you transition, you need to understand what's underneath the uniform and be truthful to yourself, dads out there, if you're listening to this, are you using that uniform? Is that camouflage just a barrier that you use to really hide who you are? And if you are doing that, you will lead down a path of darkness because inside is a whole bunch of shadows and those shadows are not something where you can be the best dad. You can't show up in your marriage if you have a bunch of shadows in who you are. And you're also just holding back on your own potential. Like you're just delaying reaching and finding out what you're meant to be here for. And it's just a, it's a very hard thing for most veterans to go through. I want to fast forward a little bit and find out what your life was like when you became a dad. What did becoming a dad do for you from that Stephen that joined Stephen that got out. Well, you would, I'm not sure if you were a dad when you were in the Marine Corps or not. Um, but how did becoming a dad kind of accelerate the Stephen Colon that we have today? That's a good question. That's a really good question. So whenever my wife and I um met, I remember she she uh you know she came from a family where she was the only child, right? Her parents were um happily married. They've been married for almost 40 years, if not, I think. I think they just celebrated a 40th anniversary. I could be wrong there, but they've been married for forever, right? And and so the the foundational perspective that she came into the relationship with was, in my opinion, it was you know white picket fences. It was like perfect upbringing. It was you know she didn't have to deal with the dysfunction that I had to deal with. So here she was, this this kind of perfect you know perspective coming into the relationship. Um, in my, in, you know, in my opinion, re- real, you know, not realizing or giving credence to the fact that everybody's got their own set of challenges to that, that they have to deal with, <clears throat> excuse me, but, um, we had talked about having a family whenever we were dating in the short amount of time that we were dating before we got married. And we even talked about, you know, having kids while we were in the military. I mean, it was kind of odd that we didn't have kids whenever we were in, you know, you spend time in the Marine Corps, there's. 20 year old Lance Corporals with four kids, you know, by the time that they are halfway through their first enlistment and they, they're, they're kind of forced that they don't think creatively to have to stay in because they're, you know, they're dependent upon a lot of the, uh, the intangibles that, or excuse me, the, uh, uh, the foundational things that uh, the military kind of takes care of for you, gives you a kind of a fighting chance to go and, um, and go win in life. So anyway, I say all that to say that we did not have uh, Mason and our oldest until I was, uh, until I was getting, uh, until I was completely out of the Marine Corps. Uh, that's Mason right behind me. For those of you who are watching this, uh, for those of you who are listening, uh, I am now a in homes or excuse me, a, a school teacher of a third grader and a kindergartner, uh, because coronavirus has forced every one of us to be a, a school teacher with the exception of Ben's wife. That's what she does as a profession. Um, so, um, you know, Mason was born in 2011 and I got out of, I separated from active duty in 2010. And then I joined the reserves at the tail end of 2011. Um, so I was out uh, essentially whenever he was born. But then I went right back in and was a dad in the reserves uh, running a small business. Uh, and, um, you know, we were on a, the first part of our marriage. So we were having kids, you know, the, the, the income associated with being an entrepreneur running a small business at that time. Uh, so it was a very tumultuous start to being a dad. However, it, you know, when you hold your kid in your hand and it's yours, you know, there's this thought process when you're holding a child prior to becoming a parent uh, that you can always give it back, right? And there's an, ext- an instruction manual, so to speak, 
uh, whenever you're holding that kid that's not your own, that instruction manual is that, that kid's parents. You just ask the kid's parents, how do I do this? Because they're the source of the information. Well, now when that's all you, <laughs> um, I remember not wanting to change diapers. I remember being scared out of my mind uh, to, you know, to, to deal with him crying and freaking out because it gave me anxiety about you know, having to do those things. But I always had this tendency to, to lean into doing those things in spite of me feeling that way. Cause I just ran through them. Like it was a, a brick wall. Doesn't mean I did them very well. Uh, and it actually caused a lot of friction between my wife and I, because I, I wouldn't stop and be empathetic and be human about it. I was almost being robotic about doing it. Cause I was going to get through it because it scared the crap out of me. And, um, you know, so I was more of a rigid dad. And it's, I, I say that, you know, now, um, not that I'm any less rigid. I'm just, you know, I can u- I can use the rigidity differently. Whereas rigid was the default before. Now it's like a, you've learned to breathe through things and you know go through the whole process of of uh, being human as opposed to robotic. I like that. I'm gonna try to push a little bit deeper there. Do you think that there was? And because as you were talking about holding your child and you were adding some depth and from the connection to your father, I have to imagine there was a great deal of fear in that moment of becoming your dad. Like a lot of your anxiety was like every chance I have could be the one where my dad ended up being, or I become my dad. And that fear I can imagine created a lot of internal uh, angst of like judging yourself. Is this what my dad did or am I doing it better? Yeah. I mean, you bring up a really good point. That's a good observation by you. I think that, I think that to answer your question um, fully, you know, we'd have to unpack a complete, Completely different uh, <laughs> relationship, and that's the relationship between my dad and I. Um, yep. And and you know, let's just call it out uh, for what it is. My dad did the best he he could given the set of circumstances he had. He was adopted, you know. Yeah, and you know, I I for a long time held res- held resentment uh, towards towards him uh, for kind of putting me in that set of circumstances. But at some point, at some point, I've just you've got to grow up. At some point, you got to say, you know what? So what? And what does that have to do with, you know, you going out and making money or you being consistent or you being polite or you being, you know, uh, you figuring out what you need to do for your life? What does that have to do with anything? And so not to just be dismissive of it, but to put it in perspective that it shouldn't have as much weight as your, you know, your future self or your family and the responsibility that they, uh, excuse me, that you have to take care of them. um, That's really what is what should supersede any type of you know getting your panties in a wad about your daddy not being the way that you wanted to so um at some point i needed to grow up and and i credit my wife a lot to uh to slap me upside the head uh, you know kind of figuratively and then also just through tough love that you know she likes feedback that's direct concise and to the point and i don't i'm I'm more of a softy i'm i'm i want to talk through it and kind of examine it and you know look at it and pick it apart and then organize it she's just like no that's wrong and you can't use words to out you know figure it out and uh, and I'm, I'm thankful for for that perspective because i think without her I, um it would take me a lot longer to get to where i'm at and you know i'm thankful for that she's she's been a mentor in my life for that reason i don't know whether you did it consciously or not but when you were talking about the way your your wife uh parents grew up and what you just, just you, your view of their marriage was the white picket fence. And like, it was that, that feeling you didn't have it yourself growing up. I imagine that was probably even part of the, the attraction in the beginning. Like she had the feeling that you always wanted in your life. And as you went and started creating life, that probably was starting to get confusing. But what you said there about choosing to change is something that most military dads don't do. And you could take whether it be a rough childhood, a losing a friend in Iraq, or almost dying yourself. All of those things, they're all facts. Like every, no matter what bad thing happened to you, it's all facts. There's not a single thing you can do to undo it. It may be tragic. It may be harmful. It may be grossly grotesque. But the point is that it's all happening for you. Like you take that power of what that feeling you missed that is your opportunity to change your family tree forever. Like once you start framing, like the future is not written by your past, the future is written by the emotional experience that I had. 
that I can reshape that knowing what this feeling was like. Like even for myself, I was bullied and, and picked on in high school. And for a long time, that really held me back. Like I wouldn't give myself permission to be successful because I didn't deserve it because I didn't deserve to feel happy in high school. But I was doing a, a self a reflection exercise and I wrote something very profound to me, which kind of helped reframe this, that early in life, people push me down so that later in life, I could pull people up. And I was like, whoa, that just gave everything. Like I was literally on the bottom so that I could feel it. I could understand it. And now I can connect with someone in that moment 10 times faster. I can see it on their face. And now I'm using it for me. And that's the, the and even as a, a military dad, like this is something I really love about military dad. We have a depth and a view that 7% of the population even comes close to. And if we can gift the wisdom that we learn sometimes in 10 minutes in what normally takes an entire lifetime to our kids, we can create some disciplined, resilient, and just well-rounded adults, like even just exposing them to international travel like we did as military folks, like that makes them a more rounded individual. And the more rounded individual, the more depth they have to the world, the better chances they have to go out and help change it. And that's the power of military dad. And like, when you tap into all the things that happen to you, that's your potential as you go out into the world and, and step into your kid's life and help them figure out who they are and how they fit into it. Yeah, I mean, what is the best way, in your opinion, Ben, to, to see what's on the inside of somebody? I think that for me, the, the best way to see what's on the inside is kind of just reflect and focus on like almost start at the worst moment, maybe. I think going to the worst, because I think anything less than the worst is just kind of like surface level. You really need to go into your demon. You need to identify your demon and really just sit there for a minute and figure out what could you do with that today or what could you do with it in the future or what lesson could you teach from that moment to help make sure that no one else goes through that same thing or to be a friend to someone that deems it. An example for me is this podcast. I, when I turned 30, I was extremely lonely and my biggest fear was dying alone and no one saying nice things that I was no longer here on this earth. Now that I'm on this side, I have friends, I have connections, I feel connected to the world now. But back then I didn't. So I take that pain point. And for me, friends was a theme for my entire life. I never felt like I had a solid friend that I wasn't becoming someone that I needed to be for them to be friends with me. They weren't just friends for me for the sake of being with me. But I take that and I show up in other people's lives and be the friend that I wish I had in my life five years ago, which is why I always encourage any dad to reach out. I always say hello to people. I always just show up as a friend because I know what that feeling was like when I didn't have any friends. So I always try to lessen that pain when I see it. And I try to use what happened for me to, to try to help someone else through it. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, going to face that, that demon, to use your words, uh, is not an easy process, right? So it, it takes somebody either incredibly resilient or capable or being mentored by somebody who's incredibly uh, capable in order to actually go through that process to uh, to slow down enough slow your mind down enough to to, um, to find that particular demon I, I i tend to agree uh with you um that it takes a certain amount of external pressure in my opinion um and some of that external pressure could be self-induced um some of that some of that external pressure could be um, a job holding, or excuse me, a, a boss holding you accountable. Uh, it could be your future goals. Um, but that external pressure, in my opinion, is the is the magic that that forces that forces whatever is uh, dysfunctional on the inside to be dealt with and squeezed out, or uh, it's going to stay there, and you're going to be disappointed uh, over and over and over again until you deal with it. You remind me of a point that I've talked before on Fatherhood Fridays that I've just started uh, reading A Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl, which is a Holocaust survivor from World War II and his story about what he found when everything was switched away or stripped away. So he talks about literally everything he owns, everything you are as a human being is ripped away in a concentration camp. You are literally 
just a number and like what that does to the mind, what you have left, what you don't have left, what your choice is. And he like, and it was like on page 35, I think, and it hit me really hard that even when you are stripped away as a man, the one thing that you still have within your soul and capacity to do is to bring love into the world. And this is something that military dads are, I think generally are scared of because love is a very strong feeling to receive it and to give it. And you have to honor yourself first. So there's something that I, I, I really dove into masculinity this winter on the podcast. And I talked about that in order to be a strong masculine person, you really have to love everything who you are, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And until you can truly do that, because you, in order to love it, you have to figure out how it can move you forward. Then can you bring that true power of love into every relationship that you come into? But until you really do that, the good, the bad, the ugly, there is still going to be that one conversation that triggers you into a defense where you, instead of leading with love, you, you lead with protection or anger or just maybe you run. And that's where I think facing your demons because you have to love all three and they have to be loved inside and the outside in order for you to bring that love. But that is something that is so powerful. That's why even masculinity itself is about that bring in the love because that love can be the calm to the feminine, which is, can be very stormy. It can be very strong winds and that love can calm that sea. But you can't do that if your wife's bringing you a storm and it triggers an emotion from your childhood. That's not something that you can work through. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. It, it, I don't know if, if everybody who's listening here is uh, maybe as, as well read as what Ben's talking about, because um, that's a, it's a really good example of, of very uh, credible sources of information when it comes to providing frameworks for, uh, for you to make high quality decisions. That's a, that's a powerful story. Um, you know, I like Stephen Otterburn's book, Wild at Heart, about um, – you know, being a, being able to fan that flame that, uh, that you know that allows that kind of that inner I don't want to call it warrior because it's not the right word, but just being able to go beyond what you felt like you were capable of. Um, the inner strength you know, I, that you sure. are more than what you feel yeah. and you're more than what you believe are. Like your heart is capable of giving ten times more than you believe, but it's your fear that you're going to run out maybe if you never felt love growing up, you're, then every, you're going to withhold love probably because you feel like it's a scarcity, like money almost. But again, it's, it's when you run into someone that has all of this heart, like fine tune, you feel it because it just radiates from their body. And it's, that's, the, that's the cool part that when you dive into this, and it took me a long time. Like I have been in the self-help journey for almost five years now. So and masculinity was always one of those that was really holding me back. And even now through coronavirus, I'm taking the opportunity to grow through it massively. So I started my 75 hard that I've talked about in the podcast. But for me, it's more about being able to love the outside, which is something I've always struggled with my physical appearance, and it not matching how I felt on the inside, and then creating these stories related to that physical appearance. So I'm going all in so that literally the outside matches the inside. And then at that point, I'll really have to go into the next phase to really understand like what else is there for me to fully love everything that's happened to me because that health has been something that I was a demon that I avoided for all 35 years on my, on this earth for me. And you find that quite a bit with military folks or uh, veterans for that matter. There's a, there's a dysfunction that gets medicated uh, and the substance that they choose to medicate in some cases doesn't necessarily produce the outcomes that we're looking for. Um, alcohol for for me was uh, was one of those. I, you know, struggled with uh, consumption challenges for for years, um, and it wasn't just alcohol. It was food. It was, um, you know, um, not being so. If it was a difficult assignment or a you know a difficult um, port operation that we had to uh, to execute against, or if I was trying to earn a spot on the football team, going back to my playing days in college, I, you know, there was, there was really, really difficult things that you had to accomplish. And it was those hard things to do. You know, almost the default is you go back to um, over consuming something to distract you from being productive in that moment. And, and really when discipline is what's needed 
you know, you go take the path of least resistance and, and overconsume. And conveniently, people talk about how that's a, a sickness. And I think that, you know, let's call that what it is. It, it, there, there might be. It might, it might look like sickness, but you still have a choice. And even if there's some type of, <clears throat> you know, example of somebody who's like, no, 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 you don't get it. I've got a chemical imbalance or you don't get it. I've got this. That's all fine and dandy. But that's for a period of time. And it's been scientifically proven to uh, to show that even survivors of, of of something as traumatic as sexual assault, over time, that becomes less and less traumatic just over time. Now, if you start to expedite that process to recovery by going and getting support, first of all, that person um, that person decided to make a conscious decision to go and fix things in their life that was causing that dysfunction. And that was a conscious choice. And so, you know, the only reason why I'm, I am where I am today is because it's been, you know, I've been having a mirror shoved in front of my face so many times to show and reveal, you know, the ugly things that I didn't like about the decisions I was making. Uh, and therefore, you know, I didn't like the outcomes that I was producing and that cycle will catch you, um, feeling sorry for yourself, this victimhood, it, it's a, it's a, it's a vicious cycle, uh, uh, that you, that you still have a choice on how you want to process it. And if you want it to change, there's an equation that I've heard repeated. It's not mine, but it's called E plus I equals, uh, no E plus R equals O that, uh, and there's only one variable that you can control that events happen just like Corona losing a job, all that they are events and the outcome is the outcome, but the R, which is your response, which is your response to everything that's happened. And uh, there was a quote in the man search for meeting that really, it was like right in the beginning. And it was essentially that that still is one of man's only free freedoms that can't be stripped away. Your ability to choose how to respond to the situation happening to. And for him, it was, I mean, you think about the concentration camps and the, the situations that he was through. And the book just takes you right there into the thick of the emotions of what he was going through. And it, you can hear it in his words of how he was choosing to respond and how others choose to respond and that how, how that led to them to begin to start dying or to start falling apart. And that, that, that R is so critical that life happens to so many and some people get dealt a bad deck, but it's all about how you take that bad hand and turn it into a flush and... Even like if you look at some of the most successful people, Oprah is a classic one. Tony Robbins, all of them come from something very traumatic. And so when you realize that it's almost like the the harder life is in the beginning, the the, the more propellant you have to to go faster. And so that's when you really need to go towards those demons because that is your propellant. And uh, there's this Friday when I'm recording this. Uh, there's a Frozen episode that I did in my podcast where I diagnosed Frozen. I dissect it in the view of a veteran, the whole Frozen franchise, one and two. And she scared that her biggest demon was her power and she feared it. And everything that came out of it was very frightening ice structures. But it was only when she embraced her fear that it became beautiful. And that's why I picked the demons when you asked where to go, because the biggest, greatest fear you fear in life is going to be the thing that's going to create the most beauty but that's not the normal conversation we had. Well, Stephen, I have definitely liked this interview and it definitely wasn't where I wanted, I was thinking it was going to go, but I liked where we took it. And so as we wrap up today, I really want to thank you for your time. Also ask, what is one parting piece of advice that you want to leave for military dads? For, um, your perspective of having a nine-year-old and a six-year-old and boys and that if there's one nugget that you want to make sure that dads get out there, what would that be? That's a good question. Well, I appreciate you uh, taking some time and being patient with, you know, the, uh, the process of me dialing in, uh, you know, the, 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 the audio side of the house was, uh, was a little bit of a user challenge on this side. So, um, to answer your question, um, I, when I deployed to Iraq in 2008, I had a first sergeant at the time, or he was a Lance Corporal when he was a PFC. He, he talked about, he talked about, um, he had talked about, um, going and finding people who, had what you wanted in life, he would, he would literally take a little notebook and he would walk up to him and he'd ask him questions and he'd write them down. But the thing is, is nobody taught him that he, I mean, somebody made the suggestion, but he decided to kind of go and, and seek out information that way. And so he became hungry for information, but then he wrote it down. So that's, that's a, 
that's a skill, right? That's a tactic that you can use. The where it actually becomes learning that you can apply is when you take it and you go start to practice it and you're going to screw it up the first time. So that process, I distill down into what I call just get some wins. Uh, and what I call don't be beta. Um, it's just a kind of a tongue in cheek way of saying, if you want something to, to, accomplish, to happen in your life, you, you need to reach down into yourself. And there's a little alpha inside there and, and yank it out <laughs> and really pull it out. Now, that process isn't going to necessarily be that simple, which is why we say get some wins. You got to start the process with um, setting a small goal so you can accomplish that goal and develop the confidence and uh, the inertia that's necessary in order to get up to the bigger things. Uh, if you're going to be a, a dad, my my suggestion is you recognize as a, as a male uh, that if you're going to take it upon yourself to go be gratified by chasing after a woman and you know doing all the things that we want to have happen as as guys that you that you understand the consequences of that action will produce offspring. So unless you're willing to accept the responsibility of raising that offspring, and if you don't like something going on in the world, realizing that your lack of responsibility for that offspring will produce the outcome that you don't like, as opposed to you you know, af- affecting the three feet around you, which is your children, and you putting your morals, ethics, and values, and you making a conscious decision that your children will be a certain way, not that you will force them to be a certain way, that you will promote those principles and values that are well thought out uh, and, and respectful children, it's only because you made a conscious decision to do that. So my encouragement is to start, we'll begin with the end in mind. Uh, just realize that you are going to produce offspring that will make decisions that will either make the world a better place or they'll make it what you don't like about it. That's up to you. I like that. And I could wrap it up and say like the amount of responsibility that you're accepting for your life is directly proportional to the quality and also the amount of opportunity you feel in your life. Because no one's going to care as much. And this is a lesson I've had to learn the hard way. No one's going to care about your future any more than you. And so if you are hungry for something, the only person that's going to help make that happen is you. And as uh, to quote Frozen, to continue it, like when the future is unknown, all you can do is the next right step. And that is often just finding the small win because that small win will just compound and like for me, my entire journey started when I started talking to dads at the park. My fitness journey started with going for walks in the summer at, at 6.30 in the morning. And then it added, my daughter used to go with me. And that was a very special time for us that I still remember today. But it started with a very simple process of, I'm just going to get up this morning and I'm going to be part of my miracle morning, which was a book I was reading. I'm going to start going for a walk. And I really discovered a lot of positive things about myself. Like when you were out for a walk, and the sun hits me, I kind of feel like Superman where I get recharged. That energy just gets you excited. But I had to go through that feeling to feel that win. And it can begin with the smallest step, even if it feels very frightening. But a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step, as they say. And I love that advice because it, being a dad is the most scariest thing you'll do, but it is also the most humbling and rewarding experience. But you have to accept responsibility for what you bring to the relationship. Yeah, that's exactly right. You said it. You said it really well yourself. Just love, love uh, is, is a responsibility of the of the male in the relationship mm-hmm. of the male and female relationship. Uh, um, you know, depending upon your belief system, um, the the male's responsibility is to bring that and insert that, which is why the relationship becomes so special. Uh, because there's things that my wife does that. I couldn't be, I couldn't, I I just can't, I just straight up cannot do. She's got a way about her that I I admire and I'm thankful for um, and vice versa. However, I, that was a conscious decision. And inspires you to be better as well. Keeps you growing. I I, I certainly don't like it when she rolls her eyes quite a bit. So I get her plenty of opportunities to do that too, for sure. (laughs) But not feeling triggered and just, humbling accepting responsibility that feedback and taking it as a need for improvement like there's a lot of growth that can happen in that so steven i want to thank you again for coming on the podcast i'm super excited to get this episode out there and i am 200 percent positive that we did some major advice here today and had some big conversations that will help a few dads come home to the marriage and their family very cool man absolutely i appreciate it ben thank you 
That's a wrap. And thank you for listening to today's show, and I really hope you enjoyed it. The lifeblood of any new podcast are the reviews. If you haven't reviewed the podcast yet on iTunes, I would really appreciate it, and you will help us get the message out to even more military veteran dads. As John Maxwell says, if there is hope in the future, there is power in the present. Dads, it's time to come home.